Mr. Lavrov, see my this American flag really caught my eye together with the Russian flag, I think. I think there is a privileged partnership between these two flags, or at least the people behind them. So, it's a question to you. Delegation, I'm Christopher Halali, uh, the Vice Chair of the U.S. Delegation. We are honored to be here in Russia. We are honored to break the blockade and the sanctions of the United States on Russia. <laughs> Большое спасибо. Я я вице-председатель нашей американской делегации, и я рад прорвать блокаду и санкции, введенные Западом в отношении России. We want to say that as young people we want to be friends, we want to work together, and we want to build a, a new world where we are not the hegemon, but we are equals together, and we respect each other. That's what we want. Мы молодежь, и мы хотим дружить, мы хотим работать сообща, и мы хотим создавать новый мир, где мы не будем гегемонами, а где мы все будем равными. Вот что я хотел сказать. I would like to ask you, Your Excellency, what you think about the upcoming elections and what your hopes and aspirations are for hopefully a renewed dialogue and hopefully a new relationship uh, with the United States. We will work hard, but what are your thoughts uh, on it? А мой вопрос будет связан с предстоящими выборами в Соединенных Штатах Америки. Каковы наши на ваши надежды, каковы ваши чаяния на возобновление, я надеюсь, диалога между нашими сторонами? А, потому что мы будем работать усердно над этим вопросом, но каково ваше мнение, ваша точка зрения, пожалуйста. Спасибо. Ну, во-первых, Соединенные Штаты это великая держава. Well, thank you very much. Well, first of all, the United States is a great power, with a great nation, with a great history, fighting for their independence. It has its, this history has its ups and downs. There are many talks recently about how this history has developed, but in any fair world order, should we call it multipolar or polycentric, in any world order where, the, where there are several centers of power, and they are centers of power and influence already, of course, the United States will be one of the leading states in any such center of power, at least in the Western group, but not only that, not only there, but in other regions as well. It's absolutely possible if the United States is guided by the principles that you mentioned here, the United States still going to play a crucial role in many areas of the globe. And as for the U.S. election prospects, as our president said, we will work with any president the United Nations chooses, but it's going to, it's going to depend on the set of ideas they use on the Russian track, the new administration. We remember when Obama lost the election, oh, when, when Hillary Clinton lost to Trump and Obama in late in December 2016, I guess. I have no doubt just to vent to let off steam ousted Russian diplomats with their families from the country, a total of 120 people late in December three weeks before Trump's inauguration. And the deadline for, their, for the diplomats leaving Washington was timed exactly for the day when there were no direct flight from Washington to Moscow. There was only one flight from New York. So they had to drive more than 200 miles with children and belongings and families, so it was not exactly the most humane of stories. And back then, the future workers of the Republican administration called us and said that it's more a blow to Trump than to Russia, because Obama did this deliberately to plant a mine under Russian-American relationships since day one of Trump's tenure. So on the first day of Trump's presidency, relationships with Russia were well, marred. We understood perfectly that Obama did that on purpose to achieve the desired effect. 
Then we began our dialogue with the Trump administration to, well, to get things back to normal, to get back to normal in our diplomatic presence in the United States. But it didn't work out. And Obama simply took away five items of diplomatic property, which we never got back. And then it just spiraled down, and it's been and it's been spiraling down ever since. Well, there are contacts on expert level devoted to well ensuring that diplomats can work anyhow, because we had cases of well banks refusing. To, to transfer money to, well, to provide sustenance basically to diplomats and now they're coming up with initiatives like like don't deploy let's not deploy nuclear armaments in space let's meet as if nothing had happened we do have to win to defeat you in ukraine on the battlefield but as for everything else let's just discuss other things well as the president said it's it's laughable it's unnatural we don't have any negative feelings to American people. I have very many good friends in the United States. Well, let the people decide. There's so much on the agenda of the Congress and the Biden administration that deals with crucial decisions, things to decide and to do for those who are coming to power in America, migration problems, poverty problems, other issues of the country's development. We saw the state that the city of San Francisco is one of the U.S. most beautiful cities. When the APEC session took place there, so media correspondence were shown how people are living on the streets there. So either they get down to solving those issues that are critical for the American voter, or they continue pumping insane amounts of money into Ukraine's regime. And we're now Pentagon inspectors are now going to Ukraine just to to get an idea where the money is going without any accounting. And it's the same in, in, in Europe. When Anna Lena Perkov was asked, does it bother her that Germany's living standards are deteriorating? And she said, yes, food is getting more expensive and power is getting more expensive, but we have to sacrifice everything to, to make sure Ukraine wins. If the American officials have the same position in relation to the Russian people, well, this is we're going to have a hard time reaching an agreement, but we are always open to dialogue if it's going on on a serious and unilateral basis. That no, some people came here knowing not a single word in Russian, and now they know many. One young person from Kamchatka is sitting in back rows. He's probably unaware of what has been talked about. Please introduce yourself. Uh, I'm the leader of the United States delegation. I'm representing the Center for Political Innovation. Uh, and I would like to just thank you from the bottom of my heart for that dynamic interview you gave to Tucker Carlson, uh, in which you showed many, many young Americans a different kind of leadership, because our politicians and our leaders in the United States, they speak in sound bites, uh, they speak in terms of scandal and gossip, but you presented a long-term vision, a scientific view of statecraft, and by getting through to young Americans, you made a difference. Many people who would never have listened to anything you had to say or heard another perspective heard you because of that interview. Now, getting to my question, things between our two countries are not good at this point. Um, you know, before we left, we had to have a press conference at the United Nations. 
We are concerned about being prosecuted. There are three Americans that have already been charged uh, and are facing uh, prosecution, possibly 15 years in prison, simply because they attended a conference like this in Russia, uh, the Yahuru movement, they're called. And we are concerned because I know that I speak for the majority of the American people when I say that we do not want our tax money dumped into this conflict in Ukraine any longer. We do not want our country to continue to deteriorate internally while our leaders waste money on prolonging this war. Uh, I'm frightened by what the Biden administration is doing, not just in Ukraine, uh, but also on Taiwan and on the Korean Peninsula. And I really do see gatherings like this as a potential road to peace. And what I have seen at this festival has blown my mind. The amount of young volunteers that you have here, people who have stepped up, who love their country, and want to just come forward and put together dynamic events like this. What kind of role can events like this and young diplomacy activities like this play in helping set the stage for maybe changing the dangerous direction our leaders in the United States are taking things against the majority of the wishes of the majority of the people of our country? Thank you. The United States of America is a huge and unique country in its own way over 300 years in over in less in just 300 years which is a small period of time compared to our history but thanks to the talents of the Americans it became a superpower which is an obvious fact we know outstanding American politicians, we know outstanding American business people, cultural activists, which is an obvious fact. We used to be allies during two world wars as we fought Nazism and fascism. What happened recently? After the war, after the alliance, the United States and the Soviet Union started dividing the world and they did so successfully and based on this balance of powers they created international relations and created the modern system of international law then the Soviet Union ceased to exist for a number of reasons I will not go into detail but they were mainly internal reasons there is one superpower remaining represented by your country the way your elites use this monopoly to global domination uh, is dubious in my opinion the United States failed to bear this burden of responsibility that they happened to bear they created monopoly strengthened it I don't mean the American people I mean the ruling elites while strengthening their monopoly, they soon faced a situation where the overwhelming majority of countries disliked it. And step by step, they, it became obvious to everyone that there is resistance to the forming global order. Many, including your allies, they are keeping their silence here. They are afraid of speaking up because they're dependent on major economies, on mass media. There are a lot of dependencies, but believe me, I know what I'm talking about. Even allies dislike it too. And so they faced failures and disturbances. The ruling elites of the United States, after achieving the monopoly of power, decided that the previous system of international relations that was built on the outcomes of World War II is no longer satisfying for them because the balance of power evolved and hence they decided to change the international legal order. And when it became clear that not everyone is okay with this, uh, by this I mean Iraqi developments. Uh, they happened without UN Security Council sanctions. Uh, the same applies to Syria, Yugoslavia, former Yugoslavia. Without going into detail about root causes, there were no decisions or resolutions of UN Security Council. The United States did 
let this genie get out of the bottle. If they did so, uh, why can't others, co other countries protect their national interests in the same way? As for Yugoslavia, my counterpart told me on multiple occasions. Yes, we did so without UN Security Council resolution, but there was a waging eight-year war, bloodshed, something must be done. When Russia, however, decided to protect their people in the Donbass, which faced a war with the elderly, with children being killed, why cannot Russia do the same while protecting their own people, not some thousands of kilometers away from their national borders, instead on the border of their own country, and people were th waiting for us to help without going into detail. My point is, Uh, to understand that the world cannot be controlled from one pole and which is detrimental to that pole itself as it undermines the foundation and in the interview given to your compatriot Mr. Carlson I said that uh, dollar is being undermined as uh, they forbid uh, to use dollar for settlements. They seek quick results. Instead of gaining one, they only undermine their national currency. Uh, they attain an opposite result. And this is true for many areas. In my opinion, this is a wrong policy. But the youth, returning to your question, can do many, many things without uh, interfering in domestic processes, without uh, describing uh, or giving descriptions of the uh, behavior of presidential candidates. It is just a part of uh, the national culture, but youths can contribute in building state-to-state -state relations. What would be the procedure? They can just speak up domestically, within law, within their constitution. It is the only way, the only option. In no way do we call upon uh, any activities of disobedience, but it is a possibility to speak up in their own country. And I think this is a way to go. In my opinion, this is going to pave the way for non-state forms of contact in order to create conditions for improving relations on state-to-state uh, -state level too. Thank you very much for your question.